Great. Well, here we are and uh, we'll get started. It's my great pleasure to be interviewing the person in the square to my left as I look at her, uh, Harriet Ritvo, who's the 2020 American Society for Environmental History's Distinguished Scholar. And this is an award that's given every year to an individual who, as the society says, has contributed significantly to environmental history scholarship. And unfortunately, because of the circumstances that we're living under, we can't do this in person. But that just means we get to, I get the pleasure of interviewing Harriet. So the idea, I think, of this interview uh, was to introduce you, Harriet, and some of your work to a broad audience. Some people will know uh, about what you've done and other people will be new to environmental history and your particular field of expertise. So let's get started, welcome. Well, thank you, Tina. It is always a pleasure to talk with you. Although of course our annual breakfasts at the ASCH meetings are even more fun than talking That's true. Uh, remotely. But here's hoping uh, that those resume soon. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, of course, you're always identified as one of the founders of the subfield of animal history and animal studies, both things. You're one of the people who's led the animal turn in the humanities. So I just wanted to start with a bit of biography. What drew you to studying non-human animals? Well, I mean, there's a sense in which I had a longstanding interest in them, in biology. Um, I have, I had as a, well, um, through, through graduate school, I would say some, um, impromptu veterinary experience since one of my uncles was a veterinarian who um, in, encouraged his younger relatives to participate in his practice. Um, since, I'm a gra since the beginning of graduate school, I've always had two or three cats. But the way I got into it academically was kind of uh, through the back door in, uh, in a sense or a side door. Um, I'm not well trained for the career path I followed. That is to say, all my degrees are in uh, English. And it was only after I finished graduate school and spent a few years, um, not, not in a university, but at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Anyway, I, I had become um, uneasy with the methodological direction that literary study was taken. So when I started at MIT and I thought really naive, naively, not, I, I, no one gave me this advice and indeed it would have been irresponsible uh, of them to give it. Um, I thought naively, well, I have seven years now until they fire me. Um, I'll write something. I, I, I don't wanna be a literary scholar anymore. I wanna be a historian. And so, um, I, what shall I write uh, as my historical subject? And I had no problem with the time and place I was already specialized in, which was the long 19th century in Britain. My dissertation, which Mulder's unpublished in the Harvard archives, um, was about agrarian themes in 19th century fiction. So not a hundred miles away from where I ended up. And it just kind of came to me really. Um, I mean, I, I remember it that way as a kind of eureka moment as a, you know, a subject that seemed interesting and fresh. There is loads, I mean, it, uh, there still is loads of stuff to, uh, of stuff to read and, and find and so forth. And it's, um, and seeing what the way that an animals have, other animals, I should say, have functioned in a particular culture. Of course, it tells you something about the animals, but it also is a way of seeing people from a different angle than you often 
um, see them from. Right, right. Well, so many questions. The first thing that strikes me is, um, is just the serendipity that, that, that so many people that I've talked to, including my, and this would include myself, uh, don't end up doing what they think they're going to do. <laughs> that they come on topics um, through happenstance. And I think it's a testimony to following one's curiosity, which certainly seems to have been the case. But I have to ask you this, what kind of reactions did you get from people when you told them that you wanted to study cows and, and other such creatures that appear in your first book? Well, it varied. It varied. I mean, it was something that um, uh, expedited my ultimate, ultimate transfer at MIT into the history department. For, that is the, the chair of the history department who uh, engineered my transfer said um, with great pleasure, Peter Perdue, a historian of China, um, he said, we really need someone who can make a narrative out of pigs. Um, <laughs> but okay. then on the other hand, I think the very first time I was invited, you know, to, to give a talk at a university instead of like to be on a panel at a conference. So to talk my, myself was at Cornell and I was invited to give two talks. And the first one was to the Humanity Center there, where I was introduced by a very distinguished literary scholar who said, I mean, I, I, apparently he wasn't the one who decided to invite me. Um, he said, there have been some weird things coming out of the humanities lately, but this is the weirdest. Um, but then the next day I gave a talk at the veterinary school at Cornell and nobody thought it was weird at all. All they were, all the only, their only concern was, would I have slides? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's so striking to me because I think it speaks to uh, the different angles of vision that people in the humanities and the natural sciences have, because I would say that, it, that uh, people in the natural sciences, in biology and zoology uh, and other allied disciplines have no trouble with the great question that for so long preoccupied animal historians, which is the question of agency. Of course, we have, have, have had endless debates. I hope those are put to bed by now, but I'll ask you if you think that's true about whether animals have agency and, and so on. But certainly those in biology, uh, don't even think that's a question as far as I can see. What do you think? Well, I think most people who um, actually deal with um, living animals uh, don't think it's a question. I think it's, it's essentially a philosophical question. Be um, uh, you know, it, and so when people ask, do animals have agency? It's a kind of continuation of asking whether trees have agency or, or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you think, you know, in a vernacular and not a technical sense that agency means having intentions, making a difference. It's, it seems to me that it's pretty clear mm -hmm. that um, at least the animals that we interact with um, most comprehensively, uh, certainly, certainly do. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna come back to that towards, towards the end, um, but just as a connection, your book, your, your first book at least, your books don't generally talk about animal agency as animal agency. I think one of the first reviewers of your book, The Animal Estate said, it was only actually tangentially about animals and really it was all about people. And it was about 19th century British society. So what makes animals or non-human animals so good to think with um, for historians and, and you can relate it to, to historians of, of 19th century Britain, but why did you choose animals as the vehicle to get you to understand British society? Well, of course I, had, I took animals as, as the vehicles because I, not all, I, because I like, I like, I like them, um, you know, to do the kind of research that I do, that I've done, you have to um, enjoy 
reading through long series of breed books, old scientific texts, um, you know, and, and I do. Um, and so, you know, I mean, they don't write, they don't write autobiographies. Sometimes people write them for them, but, um, and you know, the, the um, information that you can extract from uh, high literature is, has to be, has to be hot, has, has to be carefully interpreted. Um, so, um, so the first thing was that um, I was drawn to this subject because I'm, you know, I'm interested in zoology and biology. And however, it's true that as the person that you quoted, the reviewer you quoted said, I don't know that animals are, that it's right to say that animals are tangential in the animal estate, but it's certainly true to say that our evidence for historical animals is um, almost exclusively mediated through humans. Mm -hmm. um, whether that's um, narrativized in some way, that is whether the, the historical people made some attempt at their own interpretation or when it's, whether it's simply statistical um, or other kinds of record keeping. I mean, the, the actual direct information we have about historical animals is, is mostly stuff like their, their bones and, or their stuffed skins, um, which actually also in many cases have been mediated through hmm. human intervention. So in a sense, you know, saying that um, animals are only tangentially present in historical writing about them is, is sort of like, not quite, but sort of like saying rocks are only tangentially present in what geologists say about them. Right, point taken. Um, um, they're tangential only in so far as we understand centrality to be related to sources, right? To sources directly generated by the subject matter of our studies uh, themselves. Right, or, 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 and maybe that, maybe what is underlying all these, um, uh, 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 discussions of agency is an assumption that to be an agent, you have to be able, you have to have a voice mm -hmm. uh, as, as people understand it, which I think is probably not the case. Right. So, so I, I want to follow this thread about sources. So you've mentioned a few, um, uh, particularly related to domesticated animals. So breed books being a central source that you've used. Um, and you've talked about uh, material remains also, um, probably uh, crucial in, in studies of classification, which you've also written about. Um, what about sources that it seems to me that animal historians and especially scholars in animal studies use, and I'll get to the distinction between those two things in a minute, uh, specifically, Stud scientific studies of animal behavior. So there are whole academic scientific disciplines devoted to the study of animal behavior in the here and now. And um, uh, people in the humanities uh, often use these. Um, what do you think of those sorts of sources as a possible avenue into understanding animals, animals in the past, animal subjectivities, all those things that, that we're being encouraged to think about now. Well, I mean, e ethology, which is the, 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 the scientific discipline that, that you're talking about is a relatively recent one. Um, uh, it emerged in, or at least in a recognized form in the 20th century, although I would say that in a way it's a, it emerged in reaction to the earlier suppression of anecdotal observations that you see in the work of 19th century naturalists. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and it lingered for quite a long time. So even advocates of scientific psychology, comparative psychology like Conway L Lloyd Morgan, if you read his, his books, um, he also talks about his dogs. Mm -hmm. um, 
and and Darwin, of course, certainly did, and in his his book about animal behavior, you know, the expression of emotions, um, he has well his 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 evidence is heavily heavily anecdotal, although and his argument is well, I was going to say although, but really not although. I mean, it is very very strong about the the psychological as well as physiological continuity between humans and um, other animals. But, you know, ethologists are people too. And they, um, you know, they bring to their observations their own set of assumptions. Um, you know, you can see that in, in lots of ways. Uh, for example, um, it, it took the, um, the entry of a, a cohort of um, female primatologists, uh, field primatologists in the 19, well, after Jane Goodall in the 1960s and, and, and following to um, modify the sense uh, that our primate relatives were all kind of precursor of the IBM um, social organization. Uh, it turns out that female primatologists tended to look more at female apes and monkeys uh, than men did. Men tended to look at the guys. Um, you know, and I mean, you can see that with people too. Sure. I mean, you know, the, crit the subsequent critique of Margaret Mead's um, observations in Samoa has a kind of reverse uh, of that to it. Um, so, I mean, so if, if animal behavior studies uh, reflect the scientists who uh, are carrying them out, as you just said, um, you know, that's not necessarily a reason to dismiss them. It's no. another uh, set of sources that we can use. I just wonder how we respond to the call for more animal centered work. How do we answer this call? Uh, assuming that we think this is a good thing, of course, and I'm going to assume that you think this is a good thing, but maybe I should ask you, do you think we should be doing more animal-centered work? That is I, work that decenters people, right? I certainly think that, I mean, putting that in the positive way and not in the negative way, um, that is including, a stronger focus on individual animals or individual animal experience. Certainly that is a good direction that has been opening up. It's not a necessary direction for every single kind of um, research that involves uh, animals in history, but, um, but even, even so it depends on what kind of records is available, you know, for like superstar animals, there's like Jumbo the elephant. Right. There's a lot of evidence. Um, for most animals, even most elephants um, in captivity, less, uh, interestingly, some of the um, most interest, the most interesting recent work that um, exemplifies this kind of impulse has been connected with war. Hmm. Um, a French historian, uh, Eric Barriquet, has written a book uh, of which, which is not yet translated into English, but uh, the English translation of it is, is Animals of the Trenches, so, which is about animals, army animals in uh, the First World War, mostly horses, dogs, a bit pigeons. Um, and Hilda Keane has written about animals on the home front in World War II in the UK and both of them because of the nature of record keeping that, that, that either official record keeping or sometimes unofficial, you know, the, uh, the documentation one way or another, the people who are close to individual animals, um, they've been able to integrate um, particular animals into their narratives in, uh, I would say an unusually effective and persuasive way, but it, um, it does depend both on the topic and, and on the sources.
but it is a good, good thing to do, of course. Yeah. So I want to flip that a bit on its head. Now I'm going off script because we didn't talk about this before, but we're doing just fine. So instead of, or, or is a way of responding to um, the call from animal historians and animal studies scholars about decentering human animals to be found in emphasizing the animality of homo sapiens. That is to say, um, instead of anthropomorphizing animals, and I'm using that in a non-value laden, trying to use it in a non-value laden sense, we should animalize humans. That is to say, treat them more like like the non-human animals have been treated in our studies, to, to treat them as odd creatures that are uh, motivated by the fact that they have binocular vision and they stand on two feet, uh, for instance, just, just or they're, they're, they're curious in the same way ravens are curious, that what will we get by treating humans as, as, as strange animals? Well, they're not, but but of course, since most most historians are human, they're they're not that strange, um, or or they're no stranger than anybody any anybody else. Um, actually, I think that the implicit binary there, what in words like anthropomorphized and animalized, you know, that you've coined coined, uh, are a problem. That you is, tell. they. <laughs> They produce a binary that, um, first of all, it separates humans from the rest, but also it lumps, there is no such thing as animality. You know, if you think of all the things that are considered animalia, um, or even all the things, if to be very restricted, that are considered vertebrata, you know, they're wildly different. There's nothing that connects them except the minimal, um, the minimal shared uh, characteristics that are used by taxonomists. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I mean, why pick ravens? You know, why not pick uh, eels? Um, so, so the very way we think of the field is itself problematic. I, I think I think it has become problematic. Okay. That is, or or the field maybe not, but the term. The term. Uh, maybe yes. That is, especially from a historian's point of view, it's not surprising that the other animals that historians have most frequently. Uh, explored are mammals, birds, and fish, reptiles, I mean, the uh, ver other vertebrates. Um, but when you start going beyond that, the, the um, I mean, their uh, the relationships with them, ways of knowing, et cetera, become very different. And exactly, you know, there's a field, a subfield of anthropology which is called multi-species anthropology, which is extremely interesting, but it's, it's, and it sometimes overlaps with animal history, more often with animal, animal studies. Um, but the significance of species and difference between species and, you know, the web that it attempts to create it is quite different, um, not bad or good. And, and again, I think, um, you know, uh, with Chairman Mao, I would let a hundred flowers bloom rather than try to, um, like Cinderella's ugly sisters, shoehorn them all into the same uh, tiny shoe. Right, well, that reminds me that I never got back to the foundational question, <laughs> what, is animal history and what is animal studies and how are they the same or different? I mean, 
animals, I mean, animal history isn't a subset of animal studies, I wouldn't say, although it overlaps. Um, it seems to me that they're disciplinarily separate. separate. I mean, one of the things that I've um, noticed in the long time that I've been thinking about such things is that to begin with, when hardly anybody outside the sciences was working on this kind of subject, we would have meetings where, you know, they would be a, come from all different disciplines in the humanities and social sciences and some scientists and some, you know, practicing vets and whatnot. Um, but as the subject has become more better integrated into all different disciplines in the humanities and social sciences, people have, of course, it's easier to talk to each other. Um, people have tended to retreat back a bit into their, um, the disciplines that they, they come from. And so I would say, I mean, that you can make an analogy between with uh, environmental history and environmental studies where environmental history is a kind of history that takes special account of um, the environment um, and uses, for example, scientific sources in a different way than many historians do. So it also over, overlaps with the history of science. And both those things you can say about, about animal history as well. Whereas um, animal studies like environmental studies tends more in the direction of literary and cultural studies and even towards philosophy. Um, and what, which is probably one of the reasons why I think people in that field are more comfortable than I've just been saying I am with a general term, an abstract term like the animal, um, uh, right. a, a difference in the disciplines. Because it's represent, because of the emphasis on a representation and, and uh, in literary texts, but also visual representations too. And also, uh, of, uh, you know, the, the role of abstraction is different. Right, right, right. Um, so you would, would you call, what would you call yourself as a scholar? And um, Oh, well, I, I'm either a historian or a historian of science. Okay, so you would say you are, if you, an animal historian, if you were to put yourself, rather than an animal studies scholar. Yes, yes, okay. I would. Although I, I hang out with them sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's all part of the hundred flowers blooming, right? Um, so, so, but there's so much interchange between the two groups of people, it seems to me. Um, but I think, uh, as we've been talking about, historians are, because they're concerned with change over time, they're less comfortable um, with making broad statements about uh, about animals in the past based on work that's been based, for instance, on scientific work that's done on animals in 2021, for instance. It's, it's very hard to historicize animals. Yes, and of course animals are, are always uh, changing just like, mm -hmm. just like people, people are. I mean, in a way it's the same kind of uh, developments that have led people to become uncomfortable with notions like climax forest. Mm -hmm. That's right, because it 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 posits an end, something or it uh, an end to development and a state stasis. That's right. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So what um, you've started to hint towards this uh, uh, when you mentioned multi species ethnography or just multi species approaches. Uh, what what work, what new directions do you find the most exciting in, in either animal studies or animal history? Well, I think, you know, the, the um, profusion of good work in animal history is so um, noticeable and probably relative, easy, easy to find for people who would be listening to this mm -hmm. that um, I won't go into specifics about that, only to say that it's very various and, um, you know, uh, not, not hard to find. Um, and I'll say that I, am, I have been laboring for much too long 
on a big essay review for the Journal of Modern History on this very subject, which oh, um, when I finish it, which possibly will be um, the day after tomorrow, although possibly not, um, it will, uh, then it should be published in, in the fall in the Journal of Modern, Modern History. But let me just mention a few non-historical um, things that people, that just kind of show the, um, the range of interesting stuff that's happening in ancillary fields. That would be great. So um, just, uh, there's a, uh, an anthropologist named Radhika Govindrajan who has published a book with the University of Chicago Press recently about human animal relations in a village in the Himalayas. Um, and it, it ranges from uh, the difference between native Indian ca cattle breeds, zebu cows, uh, and um, foreign ones like Jersey cows, which, uh, and whether, uh, whether they are uh, respected differently, whether they um, have different standings with regard to religious observances and so forth ranges from that to um, uh, whether, whether, whether bears fall in love with human women. Um, and, you know, it's based on her ethnography. And so she lived with the people, but also not with the bears, but um, with the cows and pigs and so forth, goats. Um, so it's, it's um, and it is since it's a politically sophisticated study, it's also historically grounded. So that's an example of the way animal history informs ethnography uh, that is to do with animals. So that's one thing. There's a, a, a philosopher uh, or in environmental, I suppose he's an environmental studies philosopher, environmental humanities philosopher in Australia called Tom Van Duren, who has written wonderfully about birds um, uh, basically a bird's extinctions, ex attempts to conserve and preserve endangered species. Um, my favorite philosopher of science is John Dupre, uh, who's at the University of Exeter in the UK, who has written very perceptively about classification, uh, among other things, and who is also, um, well, both he and, and, and Van Doren um, are unusually, unusually good, fun to read uh, for philosophers. Um, and then the last one I'll mention is um, another kind of anthropologist at Barnard, uh, Leslie Sharp, who has written recently about uh, a kind of ethnography of people and laboratory animals. So that's a, a sense of the range of, um, you know, uh, historically informed, met theor theoretically sophisticated, accessible work from other disciplines that might be interesting to our colleagues. That's terrific. And so my last question, uh, speaking of work that's accessible and interesting and of interest to our colleagues is what are you working on now other than this review article? Well, also overdue, overdue for longer. Um, so thank, thank you to my indulgent editor uh, at Harvard Press. Um, uh, it's a book about, to put it very loosely, about wildness and domestication. Um, basically how, so also back to an old, old um, interest of mine in, in classification, but basically what makes people in, at one time and place or another think that animals are one thing or another, what difference it makes to them, what difference it makes to us. So that's where I am now. It sounds terrific. Well, thank you for this. And I'm sure um, people will learn lots from what you've had to say about the field that you've helped to develop and uh, from the books that you've, you've mentioned. So congratulations, Harriet, once again on being the 2020 ASEH Distinguished Scholar 
And I, and I'm sure everybody else, look forward to the time when ASEH can meet in person again, and we can continue to have these conversations. So thank well, you. I look forward to that too. Tina, thank you very much.